Hello everyone and welcome to the second of our videos on Occupier's Liability, um, one of the special duty situations in tort and this time we're going to look at the Occupier's Liability Act 1957 or um, frequently referred to as the OLA 57 because it's easier quite obviously and if you remember from our last video this is the one that refers to lawful visitors. This is about the expectations and duty that are required for lawful visitors. And in straightforward terms, a claim under the OLA 57 operates in the same way as a claim for negligence. You first have to demonstrate a duty of care. Then once you've demonstrated the duty, you have to demonstrate that that duty has been breached. And then you have to be able to show that the breach has led to damage. And we know that, of course, as causation and remoteness or damage. Now, we have something extra that I need to discuss with you at the end of this video, and that is that there is a number of defences that the OLA 57 allows um, the defendant to have. And also there are some issues around the concept of remedies, and we'll discuss those two right at the very end. So, let's start by looking at establishing duty. And establishing duty is straightforward. An occupier owes a duty of care to all of his lawful visitors. Full stop. You can find this duty, it's a statutory duty, and you can find it clearly under the Occupier's Liability Act 1957, Section 2, Subsection 1. Okay? And that says that the occupier should take such care as in all the circumstances of care is reasonable to see that the visitor will be reasonably safe in using the premises for the purpose for which he is invited or permitted by the occupier to be there. Now there are a number of things that I want to discuss with you or just quickly. The first is this the idea of reasonableness and we'll come to that in a short while. But the idea is that the defendant has to behave in a reasonable way in accordance with the way a reasonable man would. The second is to cover something that we discussed um, on the previous video and this is about purpose and the instance what this is saying is that if somebody is going to be treated as a lawful visitor then they have to be there for the purposes for which they've been invited. Remember if they fail to carry out or be there for the purpose or in terms of the time or the area, then they cease to become a lawful visitor, they then become a trespasser, and then we have to revert to the Occupiers Liability Act 84 if we want to try to find and construct liability. Now the Occupiers Liability Act in itself is not without flaw. And it's not without flaw because there are some things that it does not help us with. It does not define what an occupier is in the Act. Therefore, we need to look at case law. And cases tell us that an occupier is anyone who controls the premise. So control is the main issue that case law gives us in terms of what an occupier is. And that can be all of the premise or a relevant part of the premise. And that has to be to such an extent that the defendant's carelessness could lead to a visitor suffering loss. Now this throws up a number of occasions in which somebody could be deemed to be an occupier. The owner of a premise is obviously an occupier. But so too are tenants. Similarly so, the organisers of a stall would be occupiers. Contractors on a building project. So if you've got somebody in fixing your kitchen and they've got the kitchen ripped up and somebody else walks in, one of your friends, and trips down a floorboard that hasn't been pulled up properly, the contractors would be liable because they would be in control of that relevant part of a building. And so too would local authority. So the local authority would also be um, <clears throat> deemed to be occupiers. Now possession needs not be exclusive and premises can have multiple occupiers. And the case that we look at here is the case of Wheat versus Lacon and Company Limited. So that should be Company Limited. So 
them, Lacon and Company Limited. And Wheat versus Lacon and Company Limited is about a dispute over the um, who are who is an occupier in terms of a brewery, a, a pub. And if you aren't aware, what happens with most pubs is that they're owned by the brewery, or a great number of them are owned by the brewery. And then the brewery puts a manager in to manage them. And this was a case that looked at that relationship. The defendant, Lacon and Company Limited, are a brewery house. The managers of the brewery house lived on the premises and occupied a private portion there. A paying guest to the brewery house, Mr Wheat, fell down the stairs of the private part of the premises and was killed. And that was because there was no handrail on part of the stairs and an unknown person had removed the light bulb on the stairway. The estate of the deceased man sued the brewery under the OLA 57. And the main legal issue here was whether the brewery fell within the scope of the act as an occupier. In the House of Lords, our old friend Lord Denin defined the occupier as a person who has sufficient control over the premises to the extent that he ought to realise that lack of care on his part can cause damage to lawful visitors. Now this duty may be held by several occupiers at once and they will be jointly and severely liable to the visitors if they both fail to exercise the due care cause an injury. So there can be more than one occupier of premises at any one time. Now that's not always going to be the case, but there are frequently times when it may be the case. Imagine we'll go back to the building contractors doing work in my kitchen. If somebody injures themselves in my kitchen whilst that building work is taking place, the building contractors would be an occupier and so too would I as the owner of the house. The next thing that we need to look at is what do we mean by premises? And premises, in short, means the land and any land and any building on the land. And section 1, subsection 3, sub subsection A says that that also includes any fixed or movable structure. Now, this then means that what what can be brought into the um, remit of premises are sheds. I don't know why I wrote that, it's obvious it's a shed. It's the weirdest shed in the world, but it's a shed nevertheless. Bridges, scaffolding, this is scaffolding. So once again, think about it. If scaffolding is, um, if, if scaffolding is, can be seen as a premise, then the, the people who erected the scaffolding and the building contractor, both if they're different, might possibly be occupiers. Vehicles, and I've used a caravan here, and I'm with Jeremy Clarkson on the caravan. They should all be blown up or destroyed. But the caravan, any vehicle, is also deemed to be a premise, as will be any aircraft. So the the range of who an occupier can be and what a premise is are quite wide. Now, what we now have to start looking, doing is to look at how do we discharge the duty. And in short, what we mean by that is that the, to discharge the duty, we use the same standards for ordinary negligence. And we know that we discharge the duty in ordinary negligence by looking at the reasonable man. And in this case, we are talking about the reasonable occupier. And to establish what we mean by this, the courts will refer to the same cases. They'll refer to cases like Wells versus Cooper to look at characteristics of the defendant, what the reasonable occupier might be. They'll look at cases like Paris versus Stepney Borough Council to look at the special characteristics of the claimant. They look at cases like Bolton v Stone and Miller v Jackson to establish the risk. They'll look at Latimer and AEC or other cases similar to that to look at precautions. And lastly, they look at cases like Watt v Hertfordshire County Council to look at the public utility of taking risks. Now, these are just cases that I've used to demonstrate these legal principles.
They are not the only cases. But because we've used them at AS to establish the reasonable man and the, the, the tests that we use to establish the reasonable man at AS level, I'm just continuing to use them now. So, there are some ways in which the defendant can discharge their duty. And the first way is to look at the idea of a warning sign. And the central principle here is that the duty is to keep the visitor safe, not the premises safe. And what a warning sign will do is say, stay out, this place is dangerous. It doesn't prevent the place being any less dangerous, or it doesn't make it any less dangerous. All that it does is it tells the visitor that the place is dangerous. Because the duty is to keep the visitor safe, not the premises. And section 2, subsection 4, sub subsection A, says that the occupier may be able to carry out his duty by providing reasonable warnings. Now this may be implied, and we looked at implied um, entry on the last video, but it could be implied by a sign, or by a locked door or a locked fence. Or it could be express, and express... We are talking about notices of danger. And if you think about it, if you've looked at the electricity pile on places when you walk past them, there is normally a sign on there that says risk of death. Those are express notices of danger. And the case we're going to look at here is Woolens versus British Selenese. And I've just seen that should be an L, not another O. Woolens versus British Selenese. And in Woolens versus British Selenese, the defendant put up a notice of a dangerous roof, but they did so on the back of the door. So that meant that the sign was not easily visible to anybody working in the area. The court held that the defendant was still liable, even though they put up a warning sign, because they put the warning sign up behind a door and that made it hard to see. And therefore it was not visible. A defendant can only rely on a warning notice if the notice was placed so that the claimant could not see it. Sorry, I'll repeat that because I think I've got that wrong. A defendant cannot rely on a warning notice if the notice was placed so that the claimant cannot see it. Now AQA are very frequently, when they put in occupiers liability questions, frequently add sign issues about where a sign is placed so understanding Woolens versus British Selenese is absolutely key to being able to pick up and identify that even though a sign might have been used was it clearly visible to people that were visiting as lawful visitors to the premises the next thing that I want to look at is the special issue that presents itself with children remember that the duty is to keep the visitor safe not the premises. And section 2, subsection 3, sub subsection A says that an occupier must be prepared for children to be less careful than adults. It is not a defence to state that the precautions were okay for adults. So if they're okay for adults, it does not mean okay for kids. I mean, it might do, but it doesn't automatically mean that that's the case particularly if the reasonable occupier would have taken greater precautions to deal with the kids. And a good example of this is Maloney versus Lambeth Borough Council, 1966. And in that case, a four-year-old child was injured when he fell through the balustrades on the stairs of some council flats. And these things here are the balustrades. Okay, and the child... I don't know if you can see that there on there. So the balustrades are the things that separate, they're the, the rails that separate the, the um, handrail. Now, if we imagine it, if that was wide enough to prevent an adult falling through, but not wide enough to present a child falling to prevent a child falling through, then the occupiers would fail to discharge their duty. And that's exactly what happened in this case. The court decided that the railings protecting the stairwell did not provide enough protection for a child, even though an adult could not have fallen through the balustrades. So the council was liable. 
and it was liable because it had not complied with the standard of care required for children by the Occupiers Liability Act. The defendant was liable as it was foreseeable that small children would be using the staircase and it was no defence that the gaps in the banister were too small for an adult to fall through. The occupier of premises should take appropriate care if he knows that small children will be using the premises. Now especially young children present a particular problem because almost anything can be dangerous for them. To help us here, when deciding what precautions to take, an occupier has the right to expect parents to take appropriate care of young children. Now I've got a, um, a belt there to, to signify the administration of discipline. Now I don't obviously mean that that involves the hitting of your children, but it certainly does mean having very clear discipline and boundaries, and it does mean that you are expect you're, you should be able to expect adults to take care of their children when you're on your premises. A good example of this might be the supermarket. Supermarkets are dangerous places. There's metal shelving everywhere. But a supermarket owner has a right to assume that when in that store, parents will take care of their children and make sure that they don't come to a special harm. And the case we use here is Phipps versus Rochester Corporation. And in Phipps, a five-year-old boy fell and broke his leg whilst out picking strawberries with his seven-year-old sister. The boy had fallen into a substantial trench that had been dug for laying a sewer pipe by the defendant, which was on his own land. Now the child was taken to be a lawful visitor as the defendant knew children played on the site but had done nothing to prevent them from doing so. And if you remember at the previous video about what's a trespasser and what a lawful visitor is, we said that if somebody has repeated visits to land and the um, landowner does nothing to discourage it, then they become a lawful visitor. However, in this case, the court decides that the defendants were not liable because although they had failed to, keep, to, to try to keep the children away from the trench, they could presume that the responsibility for such a young child rested primarily with the parents. And it was the parents' duty to ensure that their children did not wander about unaccompanied. So an occupier of land is entitled to assume that small children will be properly supervised. So on the one hand, the premises have to be, uh, the, the, the precautions taken have to be sufficient for a child, not necessarily an adult. On the other hand, you have an assumption that children, that children will be um, taken care of by their parents whilst on your land. So when answering questions, you clearly have to balance the cases of Maloney and the cases of Phipps before coming up with your decision as to whether or not the duty has been discharged. Let's have a look at another special discharge situation. And that will be discharging the duty when we are dealing with special visitors. And under section two, subsection three, sub subsection four, an occupier may expect a specialist, sorry spelt wrong, a specialist visitor will be aware of and protect himself against risks within his own specialism. A good example would be an electrician who's called out to look at faulty electrics in the defendant's house. It would be barking mad for the occupier of the home if I invite an electrician in because my electrics aren't working and the electrician electrocutes himself whilst he's tinkering about with my electric, it would be mad to assume that I am liable for an electrician who isn't sensible enough to switch the electrics off or use the correct tools and take the correct precautions because that's his specialism. And the key case here is Rolls versus Nathan. And in Rolls versus Nathan, we are talking about a pair of chimney sweeps who were called to clean the flues of a boiler. The engineer warned them about the risks of carbon monoxide poisoning if the chimney sweeps failed, or if the chimney sweeps cleaned the fires with the, sorry, cleaned the flues with the fires still lit. So the flue is this part here. Okay, 
and this is the fire. And the engineer warned the chimney sweeps that if the fire was still lit and they tried to clean the flue, that there was danger of carbon monoxide poisoning. The chimney sweeps disregarded his warning and continued until they were overwhelmed by carbon monoxide and, carbon monoxide and died. The Court of Appeal held that the occupier was not liable because the chimney sweeps had been warned and a householder who calls in a specialist to deal with defective property can reasonably expect the specialist to guard against any obvious dangers. A specialist visitor to premises can be expected to guard against risks related to his specialism. Now, just very, very quickly, if we are talking about damage, and remember by damage, we are talking about causation and remoteness. Once we've shown that the duty and breach exists, we must go on to show that the defendants caused the loss and the loss is not too remote. And that's the same rules for standard negligence. So I'm not going to cover them here. Finally, I want to look at the defences that we might have and I want to look at some remedies. And the first set of defences are those to do with independent contractors. Section 2, subsection 4, sub subsection A says that an occupier is not liable if the visitor is injured by something dangerous created by faulty workmanship by an outside contractor. Now there are three steps that we need to take into account here. The first is that it should have been reasonable to bring in a contractor in the first place. The second thing is, is that the occupier should have taken reasonable steps to ensure that the contractor was competent. So he can't just get his mate in who's offered him, who, who said he'd do the job for £5 in the pub. And the third thing is the occupier must take reasonable steps to ensure that the work is done properly. The occupier is not liable if his property is dangerous because of work done by an outside contractor. So I'll just repeat that. The occupier is not liable if his property is dangerous because of work done by an outside contractor. And that's especially true if the work is beyond the knowledge and expertise of an ordinary person, either to do it or to check it himself. So I know nothing about electrics. Therefore, I need to get in an outside electrician to help fit my electrics. I cannot be liable if the electrician fails to fix those electrics properly because A, I can't do the electrics myself and B, I'm not able to check to see if it's done safely. So it's reasonable for me to bring in a contractor, provided I ring somebody that has all of the right credentials, then I've ensured that they are competent and providing that I've taken reasonable steps to ensure that it's done properly, so perhaps that might be by checking their credentials, checking that they show me that they, what they've done and how they've done it, then I will not be liable. And the key case here is Hazeldine versus Dorr. And in Hazeldine versus Dorr, the plaintiff was killed when a lift, going to be everybody's nightmare, plunges to the ground. The family sued the lift maintenance people. They were occupiers, and the occupiers were held not to be liable. So the family sued the lift maintenance people. The occupiers were not held to be liable. This was because they'd hired what was apparently a competent firm to maintain the lift and they could not reasonably have been expected to check the quality of the work. I would imagine that maintaining lifts is highly technical. An occupier is not liable for the risks created by an independent contractor, providing that the risk is something which the occupier could not be expected to check for himself. Now, if the work has been completed or checked by the defendant, then he will be liable. So, Hazeldine versus Law, the, uh, Dorr, there's no liability because you cannot check. Let's just imagine it, shall we? I have no idea what to check if somebody came to fit my lift. So I can't be held liable if they don't do it properly. 
But let's take floor cleaning for instance. I can certainly check that somebody has been and cleaned up a spillage and that the floor is now safe. Once I've checked it and said, in my opinion, the floor is safe, I then become liable as the, diff as the, as the occupier. A good case to illustrate this is Woodward versus Mayor of Hastings. And in Woodward versus Mayor of Hastings, an outside contractor cleared the snow from the steps of a school. They did not deal with the frozen snow underneath, so the steps were left slippery. The claimant, who was a pupil, fell and was badly injured. The defendant was liable because a reasonable person ought to have been able to check whether the steps are safe, even if they've asked someone else to do it. I have a pair of eyes in my head. I know what a frosty steps look like. It is easy for me to check to see whether the contractors have cleared the steps properly. So an occupier will be liable for the actions of an outside contractor if he could have completed or checked the work for himself. So there's a defence for independent contractors. There are also the two standard offences, uh, defences, sorry, of contributory negligence. Section 2, subsection 3 says, when considering a claim, the court should consider the care and lack of care looked for in a visitor. Essentially what that means is that if the claimant contributes in any way to the accident and the injury, then then a, a, an award for contributory negligence will be made. And that works in the same way as ordinary negligence. The same situation arises for consent. Section 2, subsection 5, says that the defence of consent is available. A visitor must consent to the risk of negligence on the part of the occupier for this to be applicable. That works again in the same way, so they both work in the same way as ordinary negligence does. The th fourth defence is one of excluding liability. And section two, subsection one, says that an occupier may restrict or exclude altogether the duty of care owed to visitors. And this can be done normally by putting up a sign. All right, we've already looked at warning signs. And that sign will say, not warning, but by saying that it, the, the owner does not accept responsibility. So it's slightly different. All right, so this is a I do not accept responsibility sign. Now remember, over here, we said that the duty could be discharged by putting up a warning, a notice of danger. This is saying that you are excluding liability. If you choose to come into my um, dangerous premises, I am not going to be liable for any, uh, uh, any damage that might be caused you. It has to be clearly worded and clearly visible. And the key case here is Ashdown versus Samuel Williams and Sun Limited. The claimant was in the habit of taking a shortcut, shortcut to her workplace across the railway goods yard, belonging to the defendants, of course. She was hit by some railway trucks that were being shunted, moved about, negligently. So the actions of the train people were negligent. However, her claim under the OLA failed as there were clear signs saying that people took the shortcut at their own risk. And the principle from Ashdown is that an occupier may exclude any liability he might have under the OLA 57 by giving proper notice to the visitor. Now, to bring that up to date, this has been excluded, well, it's been modified actually. In the case of business premises, so business premises only, by provision of the Unfair Contract Terms Act, 1977, also known as the UCTA, for obvious reasons. And in that act, section 2.1 says that you cannot exclude liability for death. Sorry, spelling mistake. Section 2.2 says, 
You can exclude other liability if it's reasonable to do so. And section 1.3 subsection, sub, subsection B says liability can be excluded for visitors for recreational or educational purposes outside of business. So the Unfair Contract Terms Act is about businesses and restricts the ruling in Ashdown. It still allows for some exclusion, particularly for recreational educational purposes visits. And you may have seen a good example of this is if you've done, um, if you've been to somewhere like Go Ape, you know, the sort of treetop experience, you have to do a number of things. You sign a disclaimer. There are warning notices everywhere saying how dangerous it is. And there are big signs on the disclaimer saying that the owners will not be held liable if you injure yourself. Okay, so lastly, I just want to very quickly look at remedies. And straight remedies are straightforward here. There is a successful claimant can claim damages for death or injury. They can claim for damage to property and they can claim any consequential economic loss as a result of the damage to the property or the death or the injury. So that draws the OLA 1957 to a close. It is straightforward, relatively easy. You identify who the, 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 the defendant is, fits the bill for an occupier, and you identify that their premises are premises that would be allowed under the Act. You then look at whether or not the duty has been discharged. Were there warnings? Was this a child and were special circumstances necessary that should raise the precautions taken? Did it involve a specialist visitor to the premises? And then you examine whether or not one of the four defences are available. Either independent contractor, contributory negligence, um, the uh, co consent or an exclusion of liability.